Well, this morning I want us to, to look at the Church of the Nazarene. And uh, for many of you, uh, you've been a part of the Church of the Nazarene for most of your lives, and so this will be review. Uh, but it may be kind of enlightening to realize where we're at now compared to where we used to be. Um, <clears throat> I want us to start this morning whoops, by reading from Ephesians chapter 4. And this was the theme for the General Assembly that, uh, that Janelle and I and the girls were at in, uh, in Indianapolis for the last week. It says, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. This verse recognizes that there is diversity, but yet there is unity. And so I want us to look this morning at some of that diversity, and yet some of that unity in who we are as a church of the Nazarene. We are not just one church located on a hill in Davenport, Iowa. We are a part of an international denomination. In fact, we are as a church in 162 world areas. That number has increased in the last four years. We've entered four more uh, world areas publicly. We were there before, but we couldn't say that we were there. They're what we call creative access countries. Um, but we are in 162 world areas. There are 165 primary languages spoken within the Nazarene Church. One of the exciting things about being in, in Indianapolis the last week was hearing all of these languages come together to sing. And to hear the different languages, and we're going to close this service today with a song that was performed last Saturday night with all of those languages, not 165, but many of the primary languages. Walking through the hallways and just hearing those different languages. And the worship songs, they would work in the... Spanish and the uh, Portuguese and several other languages. I can't remember what all they would work in. And as Americans, we would do our best to, uh, to sing like they would do their best to sing in English as they were singing the words in English. There are two and a half million Nazarenes around the globe. And that number has skyrocketed um, in the last 15 years especially and especially on the continent of Africa. In the Nazarene Church, we have 800,000 Nazarenes in the USA and Canada region. And this year we crossed the line where there are now over 800,000 Nazarenes on the continent of Africa alone. So as we were the nation that sent the gospel there, they have received it well and God is doing great things in Africa. We are one of 30,574 Nazarene churches around the globe. When you see these statistics, what I want you to understand is that what we do here in the west end of Davenport really matters. But we're a part of something bigger than just what happens here on the west end of Davenport. And we have over 500 districts around the world. And in our situation, our district is the state of Iowa, and we, the churches in, in Iowa, are one district. Our mission as a church is to make Christ-like disciples in the nation. Our mission here in Davenport is training disciples who passionately seek God. So our desire is to take the international mission and make that local here in Davenport. Our values as a denomination there are three things that we consider ourselves. First of all, we consider ourselves Christian. And while I'm very proud to be a Nazarene, I recognize that, that just because we're Nazarene doesn't mean we don't believe other Christians are going to heaven. We believe that as Nazarenes, we fit within a greater church, the church with a little c, the church universal. And there are many people who are, who are following God slightly different than we are, but we're not enemies against one another. We are Christian. We are a part of the same team. But we also consider ourselves holiness. And by holiness, what we mean by that is as a Nazarene church, our denomination started 
with a desire to fully live out what we say we believe. In the late 1800s, there was a perceived lack of integrity among those who considered themselves Christian. They would say that they were Christian, they would go to church, but they lived lives that were contrary to what they stated that they believed. And so the Nazarene church really came up out of a desire to live with integrity, that we are who we say we are, we live who we say we are. And so we are holiness. We are also missional, which means that we recognize that that Christianity does not just center around me being a Christian and therefore gaining entrance into heaven. Christianity means that we are to take the hope that we found in the gospel, to take the hope that we found in who Christ is and share that with others. We believe that we're to share that with others that we run into on a daily basis. We believe that we're to share that specifically here in Davenport with those who are on the west end of Davenport. But we also believe that we're to take that message of hope around the globe. And as we were able to witness this week, that is happening. Seven characteristic, characteristics kind of define who we are as Nazarenes. First of all, we believe in meaningful worship. When we gather, it's not just to, to say by rote some, some lines, but it is to meaningfully worship our God and our Creator. Theological coherence it means that we want to, to be united in what we believe. We recognize that there are a lot of areas where we'll have differing opinions that was certainly represented this week in Indianapolis. But on the big things, we are in agreement. Also, we're passionate about evangelism. We're passionate about sharing the hope that we found with others around us. But we also are intentional about discipleship. Our desire is to not just have people who say a prayer and we think they're okay, but to truly walk them through what it means to be a Christian. We believe in church development. We believe that, that churches need to, to not just exist, but to grow and to, and to grow stronger and to minister intentionally in their communities. We believe in transformational leadership, that our leaders are, are formed and shaped. And we believe in purposeful compassion. That we're not just to be glad that we're not struggling, but we're to care for those who struggle. These are the seven characteristics that define who we are as Nazarenes. I want to talk a little bit just about our organization and how we're structured. Because for some of you, your only exposure to the Nazarene church is just this church. But I want us to see how we're structured, not just here, but also around the globe. We are a local church, but as I said, we're one of over 30,000 Nazarene churches. So we're one of 30,000 churches. And the Nazarene church, we believe in, a believe in a shared approach to leadership. Now, we are not a denomination that believes that as a pastor that I have the ultimate say. There are denominations that believe that. We're not one of those. We're a denomination that recognizes that pastors are human beings, just like everybody else, and we make mistakes, and so power corrupts, and we don't want one person to be in charge of everything. So we have a shared leadership model where there is a pastor who works in leadership, but he works shoulder to shoulder with the church board. And the church board is elected on an annual basis to serve the needs of this local church and to make the decisions about this church our properties, and our ministries. And then we report at an annual church meeting, which was held a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we talked about what we've done across the last year. But we, as a local church, are also a part of a district, and we're organized into districts. In our case, it's the entire state of Iowa. But there are over 500 districts worldwide. And again, on the district level, there's a shared leadership. We have a district superintendent. I believe ours was here, he's been here within the last year. Uh, Kim Smith is his name, and he offices out of uh, Des Moines or Ankeny. Um, but he is a leader over the Church of the Nazarene within Iowa. And then he works shoulder to shoulder with a district advisory board, a board made up of pastors and lay people from across the district um, who work to, to coordinate activities and coordinate church planning across the state of Iowa. And then 
he reports to an annual district assembly. And this assembly will take place not this week, but next week in Oskaloosa, Iowa. And Janelle and I and the girls will be gone to that for a while. And we'll, we'll see what God is doing across the state of Iowa. But we're also a worldwide church. Again, there are nearly two and a half million Nazarenes around the world. But once again, in the Nazarene church, it's a shared leadership. We have six general superintendents, six who are elected to the top leadership position within our church. And they meet with a general board. They work shoulder to shoulder with a general board um, made up of pastors and lay people from across the globe. And they come together twice a year to conduct business and to handle the leadership of the Nazarene church. And then they report to a quadrennial general assembly. So every four years, the Nazarenes from across the globe gather for our general assembly. The Nazarene church, our clear clergy, just to give you a picture of how many pastors we have, in the Nazarene church we have 19,231 ordained ministers. Meaning they have completed a minimum of course of study, they, they understand the basics and they've gone through a process of ordination. But we also have 10,006 licensed ministers, which is those who are going through a process of becoming ordained. So the Nazarene Church, our ordination process, is that someone has to meet a certain number of courses, but they also have to have three years at a minimum of successful full-time ministry in order to be ordained or be considered for ordination. And in Iowa, that's done at a district level. In Iowa, I chair that board and, and oversee. We have about 36 or 37, I think, licensed ministers in Iowa. And I think we have probably close to 100 ordained that are uh, ordained, some of which are retired. Pastor Larry is retired, ordained. Um, and then we have about 37 that are licensed in the process. So that's 29,237 ministers around the globe. We also are a, a denomination that believes in education, and we have believed in education from the very beginning of our history. And we have 52 institutions around the globe, and there are over 52,000 students in these 52 institutions. And we have 10 of these institutions within the United States. Um, when I was in Estes Park a couple of weeks ago, um, meeting with Nazarenes from around the, the US and Canada, um, one of the conversations that, uh, that came up was uh, Dr. Dan Kopp, who's the chair of the Board of Education for the Nazarene Church. He oversees all 52 uh, colleges and universities. He was in Swaziland, Africa for a graduation at one of our Nazarene universities in Swaziland. And as he was sitting on the stage in his doctoral garb, he was sitting next to a lady who happened to be the Secretary of Health for the, the nation of Swaziland. She was over all of the nursing programs for the nation. And so they were talking about the different uh, education levels and different things going on within Swaziland and the nursing programs and how Africa Southern University met those needs and those, those uh, concerns. And the graduation process was taking place and they were kind of chit-chatting. At one point she said, excuse me for a moment. And she stood up and went to the end of the line as a young lady marched across the stage to receive her diploma. And as she reached the end, the young lady reached the end of the line, this woman reached up and gave her a great big hug. And then she came back to her seat and she looked at Dr. Dan Kopp and she said, that's my daughter. So for the lady who oversees all of the nursing programs in the nation, she chose to send her daughter to a Nazarene University. Not just one, that one was graduating, and there's another daughter who was a freshman. The Nazarene education internationally is very well thought of. It, it, it's, it's not a cheap education, it is a quality education. And just wanted to make you aware of our colleges here within the United States, because they go from sea to shining sea. Eastern Nazarene College is located in Quincy, Massachusetts. And in case you're wondering, 
That's the Atlantic Ocean right out there. Trevecca Nazarene University is located in the heart of Nashville, Tennessee. Mount Vernon Nazarene University is located in Mount Vernon, Ohio. Mid-America Nazarene University is located in Olathe, Kansas. Southern Nazarene University is located in Bethany, Oklahoma. Northwest Nazarene University is located in Nampa, Idaho. And Point Loma Nazarene University is located in San Diego, California. And I don't know how I left this one off. I know I had the slide put together, but there's also Olivet Nazarene University <laughs> located in Kankakee, Illinois, or Bourbonnet, Illinois. Um, I know I had that slide there, but anyway, I've talked about that one enough that you guys know about that one. But again, this is Point Loma, and if you look, there is the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Point Loma campus um, is one of our most beautiful campuses. It is on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and they have a problem with students skipping class and going down to the beach to go surfing. There's also two institutions, Nazarene Theological Seminary, which is located in Kansas City, Missouri, and then Nazarene Bible College, which was located in Colorado Springs and just this last month has moved to Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, the building in the picture here is our Global Ministry Center, which is the headquarters of the Church of the Nazarene, and Nazarene Bible College will be officing out of uh, the Global Ministry Center, but really the institution is an online institution. So again, there are over 52,000 students from across the globe in Nazarene universities. Nazarene's Missions International, and Myra was a, a delegate to the Nazarene Missions International Convention in Indianapolis, has over 700 deployed missionaries serving the church in a culture that is not their own. Now, it used to be that all of our missionaries came from the United States and went to other nations. But right now, of those 700, they are from 50 different nations. And they're serving in 80 different nations. Now, if you'll notice, I said we're in 162 world areas. But we're only, we only have missionaries serving in 80 nations, or 80 world areas. It's because as a Nazarene church, our desire is not to keep missionaries in charge of the church. Our desire is to, as soon as possible, turn the work in the local world area over to the nationals, that they would be the ones leading their church in that area. We do not believe in having a church that is top-down from Kansas City, we tell you what to believe. We believe in a church that is equipping the nationals to lead as soon as possible. We also have 285 short-term volunteers, which means they're not commissioned or paid by the Nazarene Church. And I will mention that for the 700 deployed missionaries, their salary comes out of our offerings. The Nazarene Church is one of three denominations in the United States that supports our missionaries so that when they're overseas, they don't have to worry about donations from individuals to keep them afloat. Rose, Rose's son, Gary, is serving in Thailand, but he's serving and is dependent upon monthly donations from people here in the United States. For us as a denomination, if you go as a deployed Nazarene missionary, your paycheck comes from the Nazarene church, and you don't have to worry about whether your support is going to continue. Janelle has a stepbrother who serves, has served in Brazil, and has had to come home from the mission field because his support ran out, and he didn't have a denomination that was sending him. He was there on his own. So as a Nazarene church, we take pride in the fact that we do take care of our missionaries. And every church contributes to a fund that supports that, their salaries, their offering, or their insurance, all, the, all of their needs, and the work that we do around the world. In 2016, we also had 9,208 work and witness volunteers. And Jimmy Christie and Larry Chandler were two of those who were considered work and witness volunteers in 2016, who served on a short-term basis in a missions experience around the world. Raymond was in 2017 uh, with Olivet, as he shared with us a couple of weeks ago. The giving for our denomination, we have a, a local church budget where we raise money for our local church needs, but we also are a part of 
the Nazarene denomination with our giving. And all Nazarenes across the globe give to what we call the World Evangelism Fund. And over the past four years, the World Evangelism Fund raised $3.5 billion. So as a denomination, that's a pretty big deal. And I will say that while we have Nazarenes in um, all across the globe, 95% of that $3.5 billion came from the United States. So while the Nazarenes across the globe, the churches are growing, the funding is still coming from the United States. Uh, that's something that's going to have to continue to, 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 uh, to grow, and it is growing, because originally our mission churches or our overseas churches did not contribute to the World Evangelism Fund. It's just been in the last probably 15 years that they've started contributing to that fund. And just so you know, from our local church, um, over the last four years, we've given $29,779 to that $3.5 billion. So when we take an offering here every week, 5.5% of what we take in as a church goes to the World Evangelism Fund. As a local church, we've also given almost $48,000 to mission specials. So some of that is our missions to the kids here locally, but some of that is to missions opportunities around the globe. Also as a Nazarene church, we have a, a division called Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. And in Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, um, it's the, the formation of this, we do not believe in just um, sending stuff or money to people who are in need. For example, the earthquake in Haiti in 2000, 2007, 2008, 2009, somewhere in that range. When the earthquake hit, the Nazarene church was a very strong force in that earthquake because we have over 100,000 Nazarenes spread out throughout Haiti. And all of our compassionate efforts are church-led. If there were a tornado that wiped out part of Davenport, as a, as a denomination, support would come, but that support would come through our local church. And it's church-led when there is a need. It's holistic. It cares not just about spiritual concerns, but it cares about the whole person. Nazarene Compassionate Ministries really is child-focused, recognizing those who are helpless to take care of themselves. It is child-focused. And it is also community-based. There's really a desire to build a sense of community in what we do. And it's transformational. It seeks to transform the lives of those that we help. We're not just trying to give money so that we feel good. We're trying to truly transform lives. And I have a couple of videos that I want us to watch that kind of share the story, or share a story, of Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. The first one is a, a video of a, a young lady who um, is a refugee from Syria. She was forced out of her home. And so this shows how the Nazarene Church has stepped in to provide this young lady an education. I am 10 years old and I'm in the fourth grade. My favorite subjects at school are mathematics and Arabic. I am now living in Jordan, but my story began in Syria. We lived in Aleppo, and we had a very beautiful house. Then there was an airstrike there. Our house was torn down, and we lost all that we had in it. Then we went to stay at my uncle's house. When an airstrike hit his place too, we had to leave. Then we went to Jordan. We went to Al-Zatari refugee camp. When I left Syria, I felt a wound in my heart. I left it because we had no choice, otherwise I would have stayed in it. Because it is my country and it will always be. even if it was ruined or got erased from the map. After arriving here from Syria, I didn't have school for one year. I would continuously ask my mom, when will I go to school? When I was living in Syria, I didn't know how to read or write. 
I used to ask mom to give me a notebook or something so I would try to write words. But when I entered the Nazarene school in Amman, I learned a lot of things. The teachers helped me a lot and they taught me English, Arabic, science and mathematics. I finally felt that I was in a safe environment. So I want to say to all the teachers, thanks a lot because you've taught me a lot of things. When I grow up I want to become a teacher or a principal. And I want to go back to Syria, to Aleppo, and become a teacher in the school there. I don't know if you guys went through the temporary house. It's built by IKEA, and it's just, it's a very basic structure, but trying to provide houses for those who are displaced, um, something a little bit more substantial than a tent. Um, the Nazarene Church, again, is working in many of the border areas because we already have churches there. One of the stories that was shared at General Assembly that was very heart-wrenching was of a young family, and the father disappeared, but the mother took her children uh, across the border to get them safe. And one day, one day while the kids were in a Nazarene school, someone, one of the other students came up with a video on YouTube that showed his father being beheaded because he was a Christian. And this young student saw in school, they didn't know where their father was, they hoped that the father was still safe, but they found out that the father was not safe because he was a Christian, he was beheaded can't imagine what that would be like for these children who are displaced and pulled from their homes. One of the things that touched me in this video was this young lady's bedroom in her nice house was pink. And I think about my little girls, and she's 10, so she's a couple of years younger than kind of in between our girls. What would life be like if we were all forced to leave our countries? to find some safe place to go. What would we do if all of the money that you had in the bank was no longer accessible and you were dependent upon the kindness of others? And that's where there are millions of refugees right now across the globe. And the Nazarene Church is working to step into those situations to provide help and hope for those. One of the other things that the Nazarene Church does is child sponsorship. And keep forgetting, I think there's flyers on the, the table in the back. If there's not, uh, if you're interested in this, let me know. Um, we've sponsored a, a little girl in Peru for um, eight years. Uh, she recently just moved out of the area, and so the girls were able to pick two new children uh, to sponsor uh, while we were in Indianapolis. But for $30 a month, the Nazarene Church works to uh, provide um, food, clothing, schooling for students who are really in challenging situations. And uh, so I have another short video to show you on that.
hope and the future working alongside of the parents. And at General Assembly, there was a, a, a really neat story of a, a young girl who had been sponsored and she got to meet um, her sponsor. Very, very moving. <clears throat> I want to show you a couple of highlights before we end, though, of General Assembly and some of the things that, that happened, some of the things that took place. And uh, one of the things that was just really exciting at General Assembly um, was uh, the flag service. So on Thursday night, um, they had a service where they had 162 flags parading through the, um, the convention center while um, the, the uh, countries were flashed up on the screen. Um, Myra shared this morning she was sitting next to someone from Peru on one side and you know when their flag came through she was so proud, so excited. Um, in a quadrinally address, one of our general superintendents shared that uh, when he, he had someone who had, uh, had been working in one of our creative access countries. Um, he was a, a national, um, but it was a place where he couldn't announce that he was a Nazarene, that he was a Christian, or it would have cost him his life. And he told our general superintendent, he said, I've been to three general assemblies. And he said, I always cry during that, that service because as excited as I am for what God is doing, I'm always deeply saddened that my flag can't be represented because it's not okay for them to know that I'm working there. But through a, a miraculous series of events and through the Church of the Nazarene showing its credibility across the globe, this year, this, this man's flag was one of those that was added, one of the, the new 162, that from the 158 to the 162. Um, so this year, for the first time, his flag was one that was flown, showing that Nazarene Church is working in that nation. So there's just a short video clip to show you that flag ceremony. ceremony went on for quite a while while they showed the names of the 162 nations, but, uh, but it was a, an exciting experience. But one of the exciting things about General Assembly is not just what happens in the services, but it's just what happens around the convention center. And uh, so there was a, a steel drum band from Trinidad and Tobago that was in the, in the exhibit hall that they had a couple of performances, and I recorded a little bit of one of those. And then uh, some songs uh, around the that the Africans would sing. The last one I'll explain in, in a moment uh, was a celebration after a new general superintendent was elected. So here's some things that took place around the convention center. <laughs>
they were rather excited, and I want to share why they were really excited. In the Nazarene Church, we have six general superintendents, and uh, until the last 12 years, all of those general superintendents have been American men. And then over the last 12 years, we've started to shift our board, and right now, again, 800,000 of the members of the 2.5 million are from the United States. But the majority is outside of the United States. And so across the last 12 years, we've elected each assembly uh, a general superintendent from outside of the U.S. The first one that was elected was Eugenio Duarte, who's from Cape Verde, which is an island off of the coast of Africa. Um, the second was Gustavo Crocker. Gustavo Crocker is uh, from Guatemala. Um, and then this year, we elected Dr. Philomao Chambo, who is from Mozambique. And uh, I want you to, uh, the, the celebration was because it was the first continental African, and they were so excited. I'm going to show a video of them announcing the vote. And by the way, getting Nazarenes, getting, there were, I think about 2,000 delegates, getting them to all agree on two people. Last General Assembly, it took 54 ballots before they could finally agree. This year, we elected Philomel on the seventh ballot and the next one was elected on the 11th ballot. So we sped it up quite a bit this time. Um, but I want you to, to hear from Dr. Philomel Chambo. Votes needed, 541. Number 11, Philomena Chambo, 
that moment has been a wonderful journey to be in the service of the Lord. So the celebration, the last part of the Around the Convention Center was people celebrating in the hallway and it went on for almost an hour outside. People were so excited and the hotel that we were staying in was uh, largely filled with African delegations. So we were in the elevators with uh, people from South Africa, Mozambique, Rwanda. And uh, when I got back to the hotel that night, it was late because the, the vote had taken place five minutes after we were supposed to adjourn for the night. And of course the celebration ensued. And I walked back into the hotel and, and the, uh, the African delegation was in the, in the lobby just still. They weren't quite jumping, but they were close. And they saw my name badge and good evening, brother. The next morning as I was going down to, to breakfast with the, with the girls, we were in the elevator with a young man and he was watching the video on his phone, the election video. And I just said, great, great night last night, wasn't it? And, and he just started gushing about how excited he was. He was from Rwanda to see one of their own elected after a hundred years into this position. Um, we also elected another female general superintendent. And in the Nazarene Church, we believe that women are called to ministry as men are called to ministry. And uh, not all denominations believe that, but we do. And uh, uh, we have had a female general superintendent in the past, but not for a few years. And so this year, Dr. Carla Sunberg was elected as general superintendent. And I believe, Lisa's not here this morning, but I believe Lisa went to college with her at Mid-American Nazarene University. Uh, Carla started out as a uh, nursing major and then was, she'll share the story of her call here as we watch a video from Carla. Votes needed, 554. Number 10, Carl Sundberg, 
So our Board of General Superintendents now um, is representative of our global church. And so here you have on the end, Gino Duart from Cape Verde, David Graves, David Busick, both from the United States, Gustavo Cocker from Guatemala, Lamal Chambo from Mozambique, and Carla Sundberg, who was a missionary's child. She was born in Germany, and her uh, from the United States, but born in Germany, and then she served as a missionary with her husband in um, Ukraine, I believe, and that is where she was ordained. Um, one of the powerful things for this service, and I'd shared earlier, was just the ability to worship with people from other languages. And for our closing song this morning, rather than us doing our own, I want us to watch a song that took place on Saturday evening, last Saturday evening, a week ago yesterday. As people gathered uh, together to worship, they sang the Revelation song. And this song always moves me anyway, but it moves me um, just realizing what that's going to be like when we gather around the throne of God with people from every tribe and every nation gathered together in heaven to sing his praises. And uh, we got a little bit of a taste of that. And so I want this to be our closing song this morning as they do the Revelation song. I apologize for the video. The quality is not the greatest and I couldn't get it zoomed in to where you could see everything that was going on on the stage and the lyrics. So you'll be able to see the lyrics and what language it's in. Um, and then also you'll be able to, uh, to see a little bit in the top on the screen uh, who is singing, but it's not the best scenario. It's just the best that we could come up with. Sing a new song.
Everyone say hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Round of applause for these wonderful workers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a powerful thing to be a part of a global church and to recognize that, uh, that one day we will have the privilege of being in heaven together and singing in our native languages. Well, thank you uh, as a church for sending Janelle and I and the girls to General Assembly. We had an amazing time. And I hope that uh, you've got a, a glimpse of what that was, both through watching the service live last week and then this morning. Um, but uh, we're, we're excited to be a part of something of a denomination that is meeting so many needs around the globe. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for who we are, for what we get to be a part of. Thank you for the way that you're using the Church of the Nazarene, both here in Davenport, but also around the globe. And I pray that you'll continue to give our leaders the wisdom that they need, that you will help us to be a denomination that makes a difference, both now and for all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and you are dismissed.